are in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they, full of sorrow, they shall be consoled. Rejoice and be glad, blessed are you. <laughs> I think you have a new choir member there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you all here. Um, it's good to have those of you who are worshiping with us from home to join us in worship as well. Uh, today we will be celebrating communion, so if you are worshiping at home, you might want to gather the elements so you can partake of that as we do. Here at St. Mark's, we are worshiping on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically Ojibwe and Chippewa peoples. This land is covered by the Jay Collins Land Purchase and Lake Simcoe Treaty 16. I always think it's worth giving some thought and time to consider how we can better live as treaty people and live up to our obligations that our ancestors uh, committed us to so many years ago. And I hope that we can live, learn to live with respect for the original peoples and indeed for all of creation. There is one special day in our congregation uh, this week. It is Sarah McDonald's birthday on Saturday. So we're going to sing to her now. Oh, what? It's, is it? I'm so sorry. It wasn't on my list. And it's Doreen Brockbank's birthday tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll sing to both of them. <laughs> This week we have Knit One, Pray Two on Tuesday morning uh, from 10 to 12. We have Presbytery, well I have Presbytery Tuesday evening. Um, it is our women's breakfast on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock at Barnfield Point. So anyone in the congregation or anyone who uh, would like to bring a friend to that would be very welcome to come. Um, it's always a great time with lots of laughter and and you might be surprised to hear that there is some talking that happens at that event. Uh, I want to extend a thank you for all of you who have been bringing in your milk bags. They are uh, deftly woven into mats to help folks um, who live far from us. And so your contributions are greatly appreciated. And I would invite you to keep bringing in those milk bags. Um, uh, and they will be forwarded by Diane to uh, someone who uses them well. Uh, I also want to make note of the fact that um, on, on your little blue sheet, which you should have all gotten, um, it mentions our vacation Bible camp um, at the uh, second to last week of August. Uh, we are going to be focusing on superheroes of the Bible. And I see that Timothy's wearing his Superman t-shirt today, so I don't know if he knew about that or not. But um, uh, superheroes of the Bible, we will need some volunteers for that, uh, for that time. It's only going to be a half-day camp this year. We used to do a full day, um, but 
but I think half day is what we can manage, so that's what we're doing. And uh, if you are able to volunteer in any way, I guarantee you will be a superhero to the kids who come to the camp. So uh, it would be great, and it really is an awful lot of fun. If you are interested in doing that, you can speak with me or with Lori Windrum or with Irene, and we'll, um, we'll get a, a great team together. I also want to let you know that the uh, Hawkstone Singers Spring Concert is coming up L next Saturday evening on May the 13th. Uh, now you may wonder why we would want to know this. Well, it's because our own Terry Terrian is the musical director for the Hawkstone Singers. And um, the, oh, the yeah. <laughs> The, the concert is entitled The British Are Coming, very appropriate, I think, for this time. Um, so it's next Saturday night at uh, the Hawkstone Hall at 7 p.m. And tickets are $20 each. And she's given a little uh, preview. There's featured music by Andrew Lloyd Webber, by Queen, Adele, Elton John, The Beatles, Sting, Annie Lennox, and one of my favorites, John Rutter. So I think you will thoroughly enjoy that concert if you're able to be there. If you have any questions, I'm sure you can speak to Terry after church. It is time now for our good news segment, and I'm going to invite Lori Metcalf to come and share some good news with us. And I live in Hawkstone, too. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. I have been at this church now for 10 years, and um, yes, it's my 10th anniversary, and, and I'm so thankful that I found this little gem of a church in, in Aurelia. I came from the big city of Toronto, from the metropolis of Scarborough, and uh, a big Presbyterian church. So it was, it was a bit of an adjustment to come to a little church in a small town, because I think of Aurelia as a small town. But everybody was so welcoming. And I just felt like I was embraced by all these people that I had never known. And I hope some of you folks felt that way too when you came here. One of the things that really, um, really pleased me was the fact that volunteerism was such a big part of this church. So many people volunteered, made sandwiches, um, served dinners, ushered, you know, just did so many things. And for a small church to have uh, uh, an older population, let's just put it politically correct, um, it was great to see how many people participated. I, and some of the folks who were volunteers were well into their 80s and 90s. Some we've lost now. But uh, it, it was a great thing for me to see that and, and take, take it as um, they, were le they were showing me the way. And so that was a really important thing. I can remember when Linda Clark phoned me up and she said, Lori, this is Linda Clark. I didn't really know who she was because I was new. Can you bake two apple pies for us? <laughs> and I, being a city girl, not too domesticated, <laughs> I said, Linda, I've never baked a pie in my life. <laughs> and there was about 30 seconds of silence. <laughs> well, how about scallop potatoes? <laughs> and I said, sure even though I'd never made scallop potatoes. <laughs> so that was my introduction to uh, the dinners that we, we had here at St. Mark's and continue to have in a different form now. All of this is leading me up to what, uh, what we've got in our little blue Aurelia Mat uh, St. Mark's Matters. Um, we're looking for volunteers for the next six months, um, ushering, Recording the offerings. Um, what's the other one? There's three. Coffee. coffee hour, yes. And coffee hour is very easy now because you don't have to bake or make sandwiches or cut cheese or anything like that. <laughs> you can just put the coffee and the tea on and put the cookies out. So it's very simple. 
if you would speak to me after the service today and let me know if you're willing to do it for a Sunday or two um, from July through to December, that would be very helpful. If you don't speak to me after church, you know what's going to happen? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> <laughs> So you may be getting a call from me in the next couple weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And we also need people to share good news. So uh, if you have any good news you would like to share, you can speak to me or you could... You, can I get you next week to do it? <gasps> That's fantastic. That is good news. Like today, Kitty's going to a birthday party. That's wonderful. And you've had a haircut. It looks great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that good news. <laughs> well, let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God together. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 90, and I'm going to invite you to join in reading this in unison. We're going to read it all together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Come, let us worship our faithful God together. We're going to join in singing Where the Spirit of the Lord Is, which is number 92 in our St. Mark's songbook, and I would invite you to sing along and stand if you are able. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Steadfast and loving God, you are our refuge in times of trouble and our shelter when we are afraid. In you alone we trust. In you we see the way forward. In you we see what is true and authentic. In you we find abundant life and new life. And so we worship and love you as the God who creates and gives life, the Son who preached the truth of the good news, and the Holy Spirit who guides us this day and always. And yet, even as we enter into this time of worship, we become aware of a mysterious inner resistance to the gifts and the presence we crave. We confess that our understanding is limited, defined by the time and space we occupy. Our vision can be so small. Sometimes we're blinded to your presence and fear that you have abandoned us. Especially when our wounds are deep, it can be hard to trust grace's bigger vision and embrace the way of peace. Come to us in our weakness and lead us in your strength. Set us free to notice the signs of your risen presence. And we pray that you would receive the prayers we offer in your name. This we do pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Know that in Christ our sins are forgiven. So accept God's grace and forgiveness this day and extend it to others for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our hymn is uh, Sweet is the Solemn Voice, which is number 444 in our book of praise. Well, yesterday morning, many people in Canada woke up really <laughs> early. How many of you woke up in time to see the coronation? Well, this side of the church did pretty well. <laughs> I confess that I did not. Um, I did watch some of it later on YouTube, the half-hour version that was mostly focused on the religious service that is at the heart of the coronation. And uh, a few things about watching that made me think. Those who were gathered there were at one point asked to publicly declare their allegiance to the new king, and it sounded to me as if they all did that in unison. King Charles was asked to declare his allegiance to another king, to Jesus Christ, and to defend God's church, and he did that as well. And it made me wonder, to whom are we willing to publicly declare our allegiance? As Christians, we say that Jesus is our King and Lord. We even put aside a Sunday every year to remind ourselves of that. In case you've forgotten, it's called Christ the King Sunday, and it falls right before Advent every year. So if we say publicly that we declare that Jesus is our King and the Lord of our lives... I wonder if anyone would believe it 
by the way we live and treat each other. Now, throughout his whole life, King Charles has been watched very closely. He's had every decision he has ever made scrutinized and be subject to the court of public opinion. And it may not happen to us to that same extent, which I'm rather grateful for, um, but, you know, people are watching us too. People who watch us as, as those who proclaim they are followers of Christ. When our neighbors see us get up every Sunday morning and go to church, they are watching us. And, and it's because they know that we live as Christians and they want to know what that means and how that looks as we, as we live every day. And so today and every day, I hope you will be thoughtful and intentional in the decisions that you make, not just ab about the big things in life, but in how you react when you're disappointed or if someone acts badly and hurts you. Even when you're frustrated in traffic or waiting in line at the store, people are watching how we as Christians react. And I hope that we will all be inspired by our Lord and King Jesus and react in a way that will bring glory to him. Amen. Our hymn is All the Way My Savior Leads Me, and that is number 699 in our book of praise. <coughs> Before we listen for God's word in music and scripture, uh, let's ask for God's blessing on that endeavor. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray you would send your spirit to be with us and upon us to open our hearts and our minds to the messages you have for us this day through your word and through the music that you have inspired. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. i 
I believe Sunday school is about to start, so if you'd like to go down, Mrs. Piercy has gone down too. Thanks. Our first scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 to 10. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And our gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father." You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Troubled Hearts. I don't know anyone who doesn't know what it is to experience a troubled heart at one time or another. It could be that we've just listened to the news of the world, and that is troubling. It could be that we're worried about family members, and that is troubling. 
It could be that we've just heard about the latest natural disaster caused by climate change, and that is troubling. Could be that we've just had a call from the doctor's office and they want us to come back for some more tests, and that is troubling. There really is no end to the reason our hearts can feel troubled, is there? And yet, in the passage from John that we just heard, the first line of the chapter tells us, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, I often read this passage, or at least some of it, at funerals, where those who love the one who has died are absolutely living with troubled hearts, hearts full of grief and pain. And I include this passage because it contains so many promises to us, promises that we can count on no matter what is going on in our lives. I think the power of this passage is that it is so comforting at the time of the death of someone we love, but it is equally about life and how we are going to live as followers of Jesus. The passage we read this morning is taken from what is known as Jesus' farewell discourse. Several chapters that record what Jesus says to his disciples shortly before his death and resurrection. At this point in the story, in the reading, uh, it's Thursday evening. It's what we know as Monday Thursday, the night before Jesus' crucifixion. And in John's account, Jesus not only knows that he will soon leave this world, but he tries to prepare his disciples for the events that are about to happen. In fact, after the Last Supper he shares with his friends, Jesus spends the next four chapters of John's Gospel talking about his imminent departure. And these verses come right at the beginning of that long and dramatic scene. A few moments earlier, Jesus had just told them that one of them would soon betray him. And now he's just told Peter that he will deny him three times. And it's in this context that Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, if I were one of those disciples sitting around the table with Jesus, I probably would have been thinking, what? Do not let our hearts be troubled. You have got to be kidding. You just told us you're about to die, and you tell us not to let our hearts be troubled? Jesus admittedly had said some pretty confusing things to them during their time together, but I think this really took the cake. And then Jesus went on with some more confusing statements. He's talking about going away and preparing places or building houses or something and then coming back. And as if to add insult to injury, he implies that they should know what he's talking about. He actually says that they know the way to follow. Now, I fully admit that I am geographically challenged. Do not use words like north and east and west and south when you're giving me directions. But the GPS system on my friend, I find, is my very good friend if I find myself in new territory in places where I've never been before. And so I can relate to Thomas, and I'm grateful to Thomas because he rather bravely steps up and he asks on behalf of all of the disciples for just a little bit of clarification from Jesus. He says, hold on a second, Jesus. We actually don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And once again, Jesus seeks to reassure him through a promise. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. In other words, Jesus is telling Thomas that he already knows the way because he already knows Jesus. Precisely because... Thomas knows Jesus, he can't get lost. And then Jesus continues to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I think it's a tragedy that some of these words have been used by some over the centuries as a tool to exclude others who differ from them in some way, to exclude them 
from the gift of God's salvation. I've heard of people being told, if you don't believe in Jesus in the right way, which I think we can assume means in the same way that that person does, then your salvation may be in doubt. And I do think that's a tragedy, and I think it's just plain wrong. It is not up to us to decide who is going to be saved. Because Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says, If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, grammar, as my mother used to tell me often, matters. And in the Greek words of the original text, the tense is not conditional, but it states an already existing state of affairs, which makes the force of his sentence into a promise. If you know me, and you do know me, you will know the Father. I believe that Jesus' words are less meant to keep people out than they are to assure his followers that they are in, really and truly in. And in case we have any doubt, Jesus then spells it out further in detail. He says, from now on you actually do know him and already have seen him. Again, another promise from Jesus. So what exactly have those disciples seen? Well, they've seen sight restored to the blind. They've seen the hungry fed. They've seen the dead restored to life. They've seen the love of God in action, bringing life and life abundantly to those who are seeking it. I believe that Jesus' incarnation and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension are essentially all about one thing revealing the loving nature of God in order that we all may have access to God's abundant grace and life. Here's the thing. John's gospel was written in the heat of theological debate between Jewish communities over whether Jesus truly was the Messiah. And at times, it can feel rather exclusive. But at its core, the larger gospel to which John witnesses resists all of our attempts to reduce it and hold tight to it, to it just for ourselves. This passage is not about who's out, but it's about who's in. All who have seen Jesus or come to know Jesus through the testimony of his disciples. And my friends, we are his disciples. That's a promise. And just in case we're not sure, Jesus heaps on another promise to boot. He says, Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Well, that might change our perception of heaven, doesn't it? When Jesus talks about going to prepare a place for us, we often think in very far off and eternal terms. And yet Jesus' departure to the Father not only secures our place in God's presence, but it also creates the possibility to follow Jesus, to do his works and do even greater works right now in this very present moment. Heaven for John is as much a present tense category as it is a future one. And it's in the right here and the right now that Jesus is calling us, we who are the living stones mentioned in that passage from 1 Peter, we are called to build God's kingdom here on earth. And that's no small task, and it can seem overwhelming, and it can seem like we're not even sure where to begin. Well, it's when I'm mired in these kinds of thoughts and feeling overwhelmed that I remember another promise of Jesus. Because Jesus told his disciples, he told you and he told me, very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. 
So I would encourage you all to do a little exercise this week. I want you to imagine ways you could be involved in building, with Jesus, God's kingdom here on earth. It could be through small, unobtrusive acts, or you could come up with something big and audacious, something that others may laugh at and tell you that will never work. This past week, I was uh, blessed with the opportunity to serve our national church at the Guidance Conference, which uh, welcomed people who are seeking um, a vocation as a minister within our church. And we got to hear about some of the ideas that these people had for future ministry. Now, they weren't all young. It was a wide variety of ages and backgrounds. And it was very hopeful for me to see those people who are willing to give their lives to the ministry. I have to tell you that one of the ideas that one of the candidates had, I was my mind was expanded and I really thought, wow, this is great for the future of the church. She runs a Minecraft ministry online with young people. Now, if you don't know what Minecraft is, ask your grandchildren. Um, it's, an, it's an incredibly inventive way to teach kids stories of Jesus, Bible stories about all sorts of things, and together as a community, Online, um, they learn these stories and they come to know about the love of God. And it's a beautiful way to witness to these young kids who didn't want to get off their Minecraft games to come to church. And so this young woman thought, well, if, you know, if they won't get off Minecraft, then we're going to go on Minecraft with them. Some people couldn't understand that in her uh, church world. But I think when you think about it, that has so many possibilities. It's not limited geographically. It could happen anywhere across Canada. I just think it's brilliant. And I'm sure that she was told that will never work. Don't even try it. And so sometimes when we have ideas, uh, we are easily discouraged. But I would like you, if you have any ideas, even if it <laughs> sounds crazy like Minecraft ministry, I want you to write your ideas down and I want you to pray about them. Share them with God. Share them with me if you feel like it. And I would love to hear them. And if you start to feel discouraged or uninspired, I want you to remember that promise of Jesus. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. So remember, when your hearts are troubled, look to Jesus, the one who preached God's mercy and taught God's love, the one who healed the sick and opened the eyes of the blind, made the lame to walk and even conquered death. Because what you see in Jesus, well, that's what God looks like. That's who and what God is. Love, perfect love for you and for me, for all of us and this whole world. So may we all come to live in the light of the promises of Jesus, the one who came to reveal God's love for the world. And let's live not with troubled hearts, but with hearts that are bold and unafraid, holding tight to those beautiful promises of Jesus, who is the way. Amen. Let us turn our hearts to God in prayer as we offer prayers for this world. Lord God, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for freedom to choose your way, and for the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider how much you have entrusted to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. We pray for all the leaders 
of the nations of this world. And on this day, on this coronation weekend, we pray particularly for King Charles III and his dedication to the well-being of your people throughout the world and to care for the environment. Bless him with faithfulness and wisdom that his reign may advance unity and peace among all peoples and justice and equity for the most vulnerable. Help us, O God, each of us, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given to us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us to be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray for the church gathered today, both here and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover and develop and use all of their gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed and heavy laden, for those sick or in despair, for those living with troubled hearts. We particularly remember those who are living in the midst of forest fires or floods in Western Canada. It's hard for us to imagine the terror they must feel at this time. Minister by your spirit and by us to all those for whom we have prayed and help us walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray in his name. Amen. Our hymn is You That Know the Lord is Gracious, which is number 470 in our book of praise. this season of Easter continues to unfold, the gifts of spring continue to unfold all around us and remind us of God's generosity to us in so many ways. 
May our gifts reflect our gratitude to God and our generosity share in our generosity may we share with others part of the abundance that we have known in Christ Jesus. The offering will now be received. Generous God, we bless you for life renewed through Christ's love and through springtime growth in the fields and gardens. Use these gifts that we offer to bring hope and renewal to the world you love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. This is the table of the Lord. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because the Lord loves you and gave himself for you. Let this bread and wine be for you the token and pledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, all meant for you, if you will receive them in humble faith. O oh, taste and see that God is good. I would invite you to join in the responses for the great prayer of thanksgiving that will be on the screen. No, I, <laughs> I do have it here. <laughs> here we are. May love be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Love eternal, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we could not fathom your endless love and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise the name of love and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please join in singing the first verse of All Who Hunger. Peace. 
love you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit poured out through him as he brought good news, proclaimed freedom, healed and fed. His life of love shows us the way. His life of love delivers us from false hopes. His life, his death, and his resurrection offered ultimate and enduring love. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, and he gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given for love of you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of this love in Jesus Christ, we offer our love completely as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Please join in seeing the second verse of All Who Hunger. your love and spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make for, may them be for us the love of Christ so that we may be for the world the love of Christ. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in your holy church all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Please join in singing the final verse of All Who Hunger. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would invite you now to partake of the bread and fruit of the vine which you have been given. Christ does not only invite us to sit at table with him. Christ does not invite us only to eat and drink with him. Christ does not invite us only to come to him. Rather, Christ invites us to go out into the world, to act with grace and share the good news to his sisters and his brothers. Let us pray. You have worshipped us in this meal and fed our bodies and our souls. We have heard your love. Send us out now to speak it. We have seen your love. Send us out now to show it. We have been fed on your love. Send us out now to share it. And may all we do be done for your glory. Amen. 
I would invite you now to join in singing our final hymn, number 472 in our book of praise, We Are God's People. Life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.